even know who that woman is. I know. <laughs> she has a very famous voice. It's meeting. Hello, everybody. Welcome to ECE Cool Careers. Give us all away. Things you never do in real meetings. Like if we were always in a meeting, we wouldn't be like, like that. Or maybe we would. I don't know. But welcome. What an exciting night we have tonight. We have, we have eight speakers on the schedule two are still um hopefully going to be showing up i think they might be in traffic getting home from work <laughs> but we have a great i know traffic what's that um but we have a great group here tonight and so we're going to just launch right into it and i'm going to introduce each member of the panel they're going to take about 10 minutes or so just to, to talk about their experiences in ece if you have any questions hang on to them until the end or put them in the chat and then after everybody has introduced themselves, we'll do a general Q&A for, for all. All right, sound good? Yes? All right. I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Tamar first. So Tamar, if you wanna unmute yourself and talk to our students who will probably all know you anyway. <laughs> Hi, my name is Tamar. Um, for those of you that are uh, looking at the chat, I'm also, I always do this, I'm gonna put my cell phone number in the chat. And if um, for whatever reason you need to leave early tonight or you come up with a question afterwards, um, that is my cell phone. So um, first of all, what I do um, isn't as important as how I came to do it. I was working in an early childhood center. I thought it was going to be the place I was gonna die in. And after six years there, I was fired and told that I should really find another field and not do early childhood because I wasn't good at what I did. And it only made me want to be in early childhood more because I knew that what I was doing was the right thing for me. And I also knew that what they were saying about what was appropriate and inappropriate was based on very old methods of teaching young children where they sit in circle for hours at a time. And um, the teacher has is the source of all information. For those of you that are looking to have actual careers in early childhood, I beseech you don't stop at Santa Monica College or with your 12 or 24 units. Make sure that you, and that's why I give out my cell phone number, find somebody who is going to be a mentor for you in life in this field. It is the most important thing to make sure. Thanks guys. Um, it is the most important thing in life to make sure that you actually have someone who can help guide you with some of the questions and the problems that you, I'm gonna ask. There goes the mess and the dog. I'm actually in Palm Springs with some friends and they just brought food and the dogs are going crazy. Um, but make sure that you have a mentor. So for example, I had a mentor when I first started, her name was Dr. Ann Bingham Newman. And there was a guy, his name was Dr. Bruce Campbell. And they were my professors at Cal State LA and loved them. And they were the most brilliant people in the whole world. And not only were they brilliant in school, but if I ever had a problem working in a childcare class, somebody telling me that I wasn't teaching something right, they were able to actually give me the words that I needed to prove that what I was doing was correct. Because sometimes you feel what's correct, but you don't always know that it is correct. So I got fired from that job. I ended up getting my bachelor's, my master's, and my doctorate. I also got a teaching credential, which I've not used much of. And now, um, in addition to being one of the professors at Santa Monica College, I run a bachelor's and master's degree program at AJU. I've also taught, oh boy, I'm only 20. I want you all to remember that. But um, I've been working in this field for over 40 years. And I'm a grandma. And um, I've been working for the Cal State University system now for also about 25 years. And then the final part, even as a professor, I had a professor at Cal State when I was in my first quarter of my master's who the first night of class, it was called Dynamics of Play. And she said that until a child is five years old, only Piaget matters. So I raised my hand and I said, but I didn't learn my name on my own. My parents kept calling me my name. Wasn't that scaffolding like Vygotsky? She immediately gave the class a break, took me outside into the hallway and made me forcibly drop the class because I was gonna confuse everybody. I went to the chair of my department crying because I knew what I was saying, you could prove me wrong if you wanted. Somebody else taught me my name, but you'd have to prove it to me that I learned it in a different way other than a Piagetian way. And for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about yet, Piaget said that kids learn things on their own. 
Um, and so that was when my cheer looked at me and said, wow, you really do know a lot. How about start teaching college? And that was the first college teaching job I got was in my then second quarter at Cal State LA. And then I worked there for about 15 years. I have gotten to travel the world from China to Azerbaijan. Uh, now because of COVID, I do it remotely with Saudi Arabia. One of the first Jews to actually go and lecture in Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. Um, I am Jewish and born in Israel. And lo and behold, now we can have flights that go from Israel to Saudi Arabia. So who knew? Um, and so I actually do this. Why? Because I think that early childhood is the one area where the whole world can unite. It is the one place where we actually don't care where children come from. We just know that they need us. So before you drop out of this major, call me. And then somebody asked me, do you, do you ever have doubts about this major? No, I make a lot of money. And I will tell you that honestly, why? Because most of you think that you have to swear a vow of poverty to work in early childhood. Yes, if you decide to only get 12 or 24 units. What doctor or lawyer ever finished community college and said, that's it, I wanna make a lot of money now. You have to invest time and effort and get good grades and go, exceptionally well in all of your courses. Really remember what you learn. You never know when you're gonna need it. And that's my thing. And then I do Q and A afterwards, right? That is right, go eat. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Tamar. I'm gonna move on to Netta. <laughs> Wake up. Okay. Thank you. I, I, um, I feel honored to come after Tamar. Um, I will strengthen every word that this brilliant woman said. Tamar was one of my mentors. I worked for her for several years, and I can say that I learned a lot from her, and I still do. Um, so my name is Netta. I'm originally from Israel as well, Jewish as well. I moved to the U.S. roughly six years ago, and I'm a mom of two boys, two cats, a dog. I live in Van Nuys. And I've been in this field for about 20 years. And I took on a lot of lead teaching jobs in different organizations and school settings and nonprofits. And um, one of the things that always made me excited about working in the field of education in general, but in EC in particular, is that we really have an opportunity to make an impact. And no matter how old the child is, no matter where they come from, we are there to give them the foundations, to teach them how to become their future adults. Um, we give them their first values to live by. And sometimes, sometimes we make such a difference that they actually remember us 20, 20 some years later. Um, I'm happy to say that my first class are now 25 or 26 years old and they still send me photos and emails about what they're doing today. And it's, it's lovely. So after all of those years um, of working in different classrooms, I became aware of the fact that as much as I love to work with children, I actually enjoy more supporting other educators who work with children. And that led me on a path to become a mentor teacher. And obviously I needed to take some extra classes for this. Thank you, Santa Monica College. And uh, I became a, a California mentor teacher. I had several Santa Monica students coming to my class at Tamar School uh, for their uh, EC21 and EC22. And I just fell in love with it more and more and more to the point that I wanted to expand on the mentoring aspect and to become a, a, a teacher's teacher in a way, um, but more hands-on and more in the field rather than uh, teaching college. And that actually created the opportunity for me to get into the space of ed tech, educational technology. I was hired by an ed tech company to become their early childhood education mentor. I worked with over 700 uh, family in-home family child care facilities nationwide um, for almost a year and a half. I learned a whole bunch of things that I never even thought I would deal with uh, in technology and customer experience and managing portfolios of clients and still continued to educate myself. And 
I'm now at a point where I am a consultant for several companies out there that provide innovation to the world of education, again, in general, in EC in particular. I'm the director of education for one such company who is, um, that's Pod School, which is a startup school that uh, began about three months ago as a solution to COVID. And I'm also consulting individual educators. Um, just like Tamar said, I'll be happy to drop my email in the chat very, very soon. So if anybody ever wants somebody to help them and support them, I'm always available and happy to. And a lot of people ask me, how did I get here? Like, okay, so you mentored. So how does that get you into the world of ed tech? Why would I even want to get into the world of ed tech? And I think that in the way that I see it, the more involved I get with helping other educators and the more involved I get with the powers to be that are able to influence and impact the world of education, the more I get to move forward toward my personal vision, which is to allow every single child in this world to have access to high quality education. And if I manage to do that for one child, I'll die a happy woman. If I manage to do it for more, hopefully I'll get to heaven. Hopefully. Um, and I want to reiterate what Tamar said earlier, um, finding mentors to, to support you along the way, being a lifelong learner, always seeking more and more professional development. No, don't stop with Santa Monica College. Go for your bachelor's. I have my bachelor's and Tamar can tell you how much she's, she's trying to get me into my MA and I know I'm gonna do it soon and I will. But in the meanwhile, conferences, workshops, taking more classes, the field is changing all the time. Right now, we are at a huge time of change and the education system is not gonna go back to what it was 10 months ago. So being open to, to accept this and grow from this is, I think it's, it's a great place for, for students to be right now because you get to see history in the making, in my opinion. Um, I was asked to talk about skills that you might need in order to take a path that is similar to mine. And I would say that one of them is to be really, really good at time management, wearing a lot of hats <laughs> at the same time uh, and being able to prioritize uh, in order not to drop any ball um, and being a people's person, learning how to communicate in a way that will speak to everyone. Um, there's a lot of talk lately about diversity, about inclusion, being culturally sensitive, being able to communicate with anyone, no matter their age, no matter their background, no matter their race, no matter their language, and just finding that common ground of communication with them is key when we work with children and with families, and it's key when we're working with adults in the field. And I truly believe that this is the only way to bring about change. Um, and I would say that another thing that is really, really important in my book is teamwork and team leadership. I wouldn't be where I am today if I didn't learn how to be a, a team player. I'm a big personality. I can walk into a room and own it, but that got me nowhere. And the only success that I, that I saw came when I allowed others in, when I gave them the spot in the sunshine. And it's the hardest thing to do, to be a lead teacher and take a step back and let others take the lead instead of you and not jumping into the rescue at every single second. Um, but experiencing that, experiencing what it really means to be part of a team taught me how to lead teams as well. Um, so I'm saying thank you to every single director who I ever worked for, who gave me the advice of shut up and stand at the back of the room. So <laughs> thank you for that. Um, I think that's about it for me. Awesome, thank you, Netta. 
Um, I just want to echo what Netta said about her being a good mentor. That is the understatement of the year. <laughs> a job before I worked for Santa Monica College, I worked for a company called LA Up and I was a coach and I would, I would um, observe her in the classroom and she's, she's absolutely amazing. So props to you. I'd like to move on to Ramona next. Hi, Ramona. Hi, it's hard to speak after Netta and Tamar with all that experience. <laughs> So my name is Ramona Ochoa. I'm a special education teacher for early childhood. Um, I've been in the field for over 22 years. Uh, first, I was a special ed assistant for 15 years. So I'm just new to the teacher world as far as like, you know, taking the whole like the leadership. Um, but it's been a great experience. And like Neta said, it's like you have to be a team player, like make sure you have a mentor. Um, it's sad to say that in the, I went to Castle LA and it was hard because it's the difficult part is like, getting the financial aid, getting the support from the office, you left the paper here and they lost the paper. Like, how do I get applied to this deadlines? And it was so overwhelming. That part was the overwhelming part, but you had my, I had my classmates, my cohorts. So we learned from each other. We helped each other out. It's just like sharing your, you know, your uh, receiving and giving advice and just being a team player. But so I've been teaching for going on five years now. Um, I taught in South Central and now I'm in Huntington Park. I'm in a collaborative classroom, so it is challenging, you know, to collaborate at times. We're all human. We have different personalities. So every year I have been working with a different teacher, and every year it's challenging because it's like a marriage. Like I have my own personality, and I'm controlling. I want to take, I want to just be with my kids and just do what I want to do, my style of teaching. But now I have to collaborate with someone else that has a different teaching style than I do. And then I'm learning from her, and she's learning from me, like, you know, different strategies and how kids with disabilities learn differently than the kids with general ed. And just the whole, it's like we're bumping heads, but we're learning from each other at the same time. Um, so my program at Castle Relay was for two years. First, you have to have your BA and then um, get the CBIS. And the way I started, and I worked for LA Unified. So the way I got into the program was I was a special ed assistant. And then I, I took the CBIS and I passed the CBIS. And then I applied. Um, LUSD and Castle Relay have a, a program together where you can get an emergency credential. So even though I didn't have my degree or my credential, I was able to get into the classroom um, and start teaching already. I mean, not at the full regular pay as a teacher, but more than an assistant. And so I started there with my emergency credential. And as I was going at the same time to school and the two-year program, and then there was like internship pro internships while I'm doing my field work, my professor was coming to observe me in the classroom. And in the summer when I wasn't working for LAUSD, I was doing my field work um, with ages zero to two. And I went to Atwater Village. So I was there working with the very, very young ones, which is very different because childhood is so diverse. They should change it. It's like from zero to five is such a gap. Even three to five is so, it's challenging. They're so different, you know? And then, um, so that was that. It was challenging, but like I said, if you, you know, make friends, um, talk to your professors. Most professors, they all want to help you. They want you to be successful. They want to teach you, they want you to learn, they want you to come back and like do things like this. Like, I'm very honored. Thank you, Kathy, for inviting me. This is my first, like, you know, talking to people. I'm a little bit nervous, but but it's just like I would never think that I would be in this position, you know. Like, first I was a TA for so many years. And what, what motivated me to do this was like I would see like very good teachers, but sadly, a lot of not good teachers. And they, they, there's such a need for teachers, you know, such a good need for teachers that are dedicated and passionate teachers, especially in the special education field. Like at first I was scared. I'm like, I don't want to be a special ed teacher. The kids are so challenging and the kids are challenging at all. Janet, special ed, they all have different personalities and we're in a different generation with working with a different generation of students that the whole, like the way parenting, everything's changing so drastically. There's so many different personalities and ways, you know, but so I just went into the special field and I've been loving it just the kids with Down syndrome, with autism, like every, there's never a boring day because it's always like different experiences working with the parents. I mean, there's challenging times as well, but but it's so rewarding, you know, when they meet their goals and the parents are so happy, like they came into your classroom, they were not speaking and now they're speaking, you know, it's it's so rewarding. But um, yeah, so and then our, in, our, in the credential program for LAUSD, they start off like, I don't know, like 3000 $3,500 a month because they pay you monthly. And then as you get the credential, it goes up like $1,000. But then in LAUSD, it has like, you have 10 years. Once you have your, like say I got my credential, you have 10 years to get your all your units that the LAUSD lets you get. 
to move up the salary scale. So you can go up to 80,000, 100,000, depending like if you get your master's, you go up. Like I'm, so when you, if you apply, if you're interested in the Cal State LA program, I'm sure other schools have it too. You have like, you get the credential, it takes you two years, but you only take four more classes and it's embedded. So you get the master's and the credential together. So it's might as well get the master's right. If you're gonna take the same amount of classes for the master's, you take four more and you have the, I mean, you have you two years for the credential, a couple more classes and you get the master's. So you get to choose a comp or the thesis. I took the comps. <laughs> it's doable. I have two kids. I have a dog. I have my boyfriend. It was so stressful, but I mean, you can do it. You just study, you, you, you know, you set your mind to it and you just, you do it, you know, but um, what else can I say? I think that's about it. Yeah. So, you know, the advantages and disadvantages, just the, the joy in the kids' faces are so like honest and nurturing and they just, they just love you unconditionally and the parents, most parents are so super grateful. And the only disadvantages I could say of my job is, um, you know, if you want to be a super fun teacher, a lot of the money comes out of your pocket. If you want to do fun activities, fun lessons, that's, you know, the disadvantage. But if you love it so much, you don't even care, you know? Because my daughter, the fortune, she's like, oh, for your kids. Because I always say, for my babies, for my babies. They're like, everything's for your babies. <laughs> for next year's Halloween, for next year's Christmas. You know, you just want to always just bargain shop and get all these goodies to make the learning fun, you know, hands-on fun. Um, and the typical work day, I work, um, well, before COVID, it was 8 to 12.30. So it's a collaborative classroom. And then, so the kids go home at 12.30 and then I might continue till 2.30. And then I do like IEPs. If, I don't know if anybody knows about that. It's an individual education plan. So every of a kid with a disability has their own educational plan and they have their own goals and objectives. So I work on that or DRDPs, you know, the, the preschool assessment. Um, just talking to parents or, or meeting with like related services like occupational therapists, speech therapists, physical therapists, adaptive PE teachers. Like we share ideas or concerns or they have questions because we don't really see them. We don't really talk to them all the time. So we try to, you know, on the phone or they when they come, we meet really quick. Um, and again, the advantage is also is that if you work, I mean, LAUSD for a school, you work 10 months out of the year and you're getting paid on the summer. You know, you get the, all the breaks, all, of, all the Christmas breaks, all the holidays, all like Thanksgiving, you get a whole week. For Christmas, you get three weeks. <laughs> but um, I don't know if you have any questions for later, but thank you guys. And thank you for having your cameras on because it's hard to speak to someone when there's a black screen. Thank you. What were you referring to with the 3,500? Um, you were working as a teacher without your credential? Mm -hmm. Yes. So, you, so wait, you had your bachelor's or you just didn't have? So I had my bachelor's in communication disorders. And then okay. I took the CBIS test to get into the program at Cal State LA. And so you're getting paid without your credential. They give you an emergency credential. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Ramona. Thank you so much. And you know, I did comps too. Because I, I had too many ideas, and if you if you get your master's at Cal State, um, you're going to do a comprehensive exam or a thesis. And a comprehensive exam, I, I think they changed it. When I did it, you wrote ten mini theses. I think it's seven now. I think I was the last one that did ten back in 2012. Yeah, and then you go and you basically are quizzed on your own mini theses, but you yeah. wrote them. So you should know it, you know. Um, and for me, I couldn't, I couldn't focus on what I wanted to do. So my mentor said, "Okay, you're too all over the place. You're never going to graduate if you don't do this. So just do your comps, do them all." And I did, and yeah, thank goodness. But thank I, I think if you're like a super writer, and, and I mean, I guess it's different for everybody. But now I kind of regret doing the comps. I wish I would have taken the thesis because my one of my prof my professor said, if you want to move on, you know, be a doctorate or or do other things with your career, you can. The thesis shows that you did something like some research or you wrote something versus the comps is just a test and it's just you're done you know you have your master's you took a test but if you got your master's and you wrote a thesis it's, it looks a little better i guess i respectfully disagree oh, okay. <laughs> i'm in a phd program as we speak doing quite well and i did it i did comps so okay. yeah I, no, no offense to your mentor but <laughs> There yeah, you go. everybody's different comps take you take the test you have to memorize all the laws of special ed and why laws change all the disabilities yep. Yep. there you go yeah. awesome thank you so much Ramona so wonderful wonderful to have an early intervention person here 
Thank you. I'm going to move on to one of my very best friends in the world, Malena. Oh, what an introduction. Thank you, Kathy. Um, so this is my first time as it is um, Ramona's to um, present. And it's, it's such a unique opportunity because it's about me. It's not about theory. It's not about practice and um, compliance and licensing. It's, it's about me. So cut me off. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so I guess I'll start with my journey, like a quick overview. Um, I originally started college um, right out of high school as um, more of a science and math major. I was really interested in that. It could have been um, chemistry, biochemistry, engineering. You know, I, I was interested in all of them and tried all of them. Um, they still interest me. I still enjoy them. Um, I did take some time off to get married and start my family. And then when I returned, I saw in the school schedule that there was um, child development classes. And I was like, what? What's child development? Um, but since I have children uh, or my son now, maybe I should take some science courses um, towards my degree and do a child development class just so, you know, just to educate myself a little bit about parenthood and, and children and what's new nowadays. Well, first day of class, right after class, I walked um, into the office and changed my major. Um, the professor who was who you know ended up being a, a mentor of mine um, presented the it, it was called intro to careers introduction to careers and child development and she just opened this world up for me that i always thought preschool teachers are preschool teachers and that's what they choose to do with their life with their career you know and and like Ramona said it does turn into your life um and that never really I mean I love children um but it wasn't some like a career path that I had an interest in at the time just to be perfectly honest um but after this class um she had presented kind of like what we're doing now um she invited panelists to come and share about their their careers and what they did and how they got there. And it, it, it changed my life. Um, I had no idea that all of these options were out there, a lot of which sounded amazing to me. Um, and it, it was just, it just changed my life. That one lecture, the, the one experience kind of like um, what you are all doing today. So it's very special for me to be here. And, and I hope that um, my information can guide you, whether it be towards child development or against child development um, in, in your careers. So I changed my major and I did get my associates in child development at the community college. Um, my first job was as an assistant teacher at the lab school. And I want to go back to what um, I think Tamar and actually everybody has touched on Netta and Ramona about mentors and I'd like to add building that community that that really is is I think where it's at for me in this field is the people that you meet the ideas that you exchange with them and the change that you make in the world is just beyond words for me um, so that first experience at the lab school um, really set the foundation for everything that came after. Um, you know, the ladies have said before me that um, you have to work hard. You really do. Um, I think the, the false impression that I had of the field before is kind of like, you know, the 12 units or the six units. And not that there's anything wrong with that. I'm not speaking down to it. It just wasn't what I was looking for. And I didn't know that there was more. So I think, you know, tonight, if anything, I just want you to know that there is so much more um, and that people who being in the classroom is not their first choice could still have a lot to contribute to the field. Um, I currently am not working in, in the classroom, so I'll share a little bit about that. But let me know when I get close to the 10 minutes. So I worked, I worked there and 
worked part time as an assistant and then continued my my education and received a bachelor's um, from child and adolescent development from CSUN. And then I decided to make a career move because when I worked at the college, and I think this will resonate with a lot of you that have experience in the field, and I think someone touched on it earlier, was that you end up spending a lot of money of your own money or, or things like that. Um, at the lab school, we didn't have that, that issue. Like pretty much we, we had resources, we had budgets and we were able to get those um, through the college and not out of our pockets. And the building that we worked in was specifically designed and built to be a child development center. It was amazing, multi-million dollar um, building that was made for that. And I worked there for over 10 years, you know, um, mentoring college students that worked in my classroom. And what I started noticing um, year after year was that I did have some students that were brave and would, you know, communicate openly with me and say, yeah, that's fine, but you have this budget or you have the support of your director or look at this building. Of course, your classroom is gorgeous. And it really, after a while, it was like that, you know, pebble in the bucket and it just kept getting heavier and heavier. And it really made me question how I was supporting others in the field when I did have it great. It was, it was an amazing place to work you know, it had nothing to do with the fact that I worked with Kathy. Um, <laughs> um, and so I decided to make a move. And um, being a Head Start graduate myself, I attended um, Head Start as a preschooler, I decided to go back and give back at least the two years that I had attended. Um, and and kind of look at the world through a different lens you know, to see if, if these advices and strategies and things that I was giving to students really were not realistic. It wasn't like I didn't work in the real world. Um, so I made the leap. It was, it was scary and it was a big decision and I didn't know. Um, so that is, you know, another part of the field is there's so much out there that you really don't know. So sometimes you have to take those um, those scary steps and, and you know, growth happens outside of your comfort zone. So I think that this is the perfect field for that because there is such a variety of opportunities that you will find if you're willing to step outside of your comfort zone. So I was a, a teacher in a Head Start classroom for about um, three years and that was an awakening. <laughs> I, it was super fulfilling because I, I did see myself in the children that I was teaching. Um, it was very hard if any of you have ever worked in Head Start. Um, it's a very challenging, the population that you work with and the support that you get. So I did that for about three years. And then I decided I found, again, just browsing out there, just looking, just asking questions, just talking with coworkers and supervisors and mentors, that there was this program um, called a home-based educator. And I was like, what, what is that? Um, and it's, it's a parent educator position. So I had a caseload of 10 children, 10 families, and I would visit them weekly. And we would talk about child development and it was mostly parent education. The child is there and we're facilitating the activity with the child, um, but it's the parent facilitating the activity with the child and the educator supporting the parent. Um, and I thought that was amazing because um, I really missed working with adults from when we worked at the college, the college students. Um, I realized how much I missed that. I did like working in the classroom, but when I was at Head Start only working in the classroom, I realized that I really missed working with the adults. And so I took I took that leap. And again, the my supervisor, I knew from almost the beginning when she interviewed me uh, and we started talking that she really, 
was a pillar. Like she knew her passion. She knew that her standards were high and she would never lower them for anyone. And I was just like, wow, this is the person that I want to work for. Um, and I've been with her over four years now and it, she is the same. And she even actually, there was mergers within departments at my agency. And I actually applied for my current position because she no longer supervised my former position and there was an opening with her here. So um, that was, you know, that's a career choice that probably had nothing to do with you know, the actual field, but it goes back to the mentors in the community that you build is you, you surround yourself with those people. And as Kathy said, um, she and I are the closest and um, the things that I admire about her are, are that, are, you know, her ideas and um, her willingness to stand up for what is right. And I think that's really needed in the field. Um, and that will, that is a skill that, that, people will notice and that will get you where you want to go. Um, it's not easy and um, you're, you, you know, you're going to have tough conversations with people, but in the end, um, that is, that is what, what this field is about. And that's what our field needs is people that are willing to stand up for what's right and what's wrong. Um, and, you know, that kind of ties into the COVID thing and, and the changes that we're seeing now too. Um, so I've just celebrated my, my one year anniversary as an early learning supervisor with a Head Start program. I um, oversee the operations of four Head Start centers in the San Fernando Valley. Um, I have three center directors um, under me. Um, I think it's like between all the, all the teachers, it's like 40 staff and close to 300 children. Um, I do do classroom observations. I do file reviews, um, you know, going into the typical day of what I currently do. Um, but it is ultimately under my supervision that the daily operations of, of the center um, need to be in compliance with licensing and curriculum and HR. And so my current position entails all of it. Um, I was just speaking to someone. I went to get my eyes checked and she was like, what do you do? And I'm like, wow, that's that's I don't know if there's a nutshell big enough for that. I'm like there, you know, before COVID, there are days when I would cover the classroom and change diapers and. And there are other days when I'm, you know, either in Sacramento or, you know, in Zoom with Sacramento and government and, and you know, those agencies to see not only that we are meeting our requirements, but how we can make it better. So it is a huge range that, that I deal with. I deal with, you know, staff and HR and facilities and, you know, some of our centers are on LAUSD campuses, so we work closely with them. Um, so, it, I mean, if you have specific questions about that, we can go into that later, but that that is currently what I do. Um, and the salary, I think I might have to agree with, with Tamar and, and others that if you work hard and you really focus on your education, that the, the opportunities are out there. Um, I One of the things, honestly, that drew me to, to being a preschool teacher when I was one was that my children were young. And like Ramona said, I had summers off. I had summers off. I had holidays off. You know, the money wasn't there, but it really, really worked for me and my family. Um, as my children got older, this actually is my first 12 month um, position that I've had. Um, and there's a lot of flexibility, you know, because of, of the work that I do, I am salary and I'm able to schedule my days as long as I'm meeting, you know, my job requirements, you know, in combination with my amazing supervisor, my amazing manager is I do have that flexibility if I need to go get my eyes checked in the middle of the day, you know, I, it's different than being in the classroom. When I was in the classroom, I couldn't just say, hey, you know, I need to reschedule you 12 children for a couple hours. I need to step out. You know, there, there wasn't that. And I think that the job that I have now is amazing. It works um, for, for me and my family and, you know, my learning style. How much time do I have left, Kathy? None, I'm over. <laughs>
<laughs> okay, so that's the general overview. Um, I am currently um, finishing my thesis to get my master's at Pacific Oaks. Um, all just about 99% of that has to do with Kathy's encouragement and support and her example that she set. So I just kind of follow her example and we piggyback off of each other. Um, and my thesis when completed will be risk taking in early childhood and how that affects brain development. Keep, keep an eye out for it. Thank you. You're all gonna wanna read her thesis. We went to Denmark <laughs> in the forest kindergartens and it's incredible. And you're nice to say my encouragement to get your master's. I kicked you and you got it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Malena. Malena and I were co-teachers at Moorpark College Child Development Center for many years. And it was a magical experience, as she said. And we both yeah. really moved on a lot since. So there you go. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much. We have a couple more speakers to introduce before we get to our Q&A. What a great group we have. Oh, my goodness. Um, so I wanted to move on next to Pilar. Is Pilar still there? I see your camera is off, Pilar. Are you ready to talk or should I come back to you? Looks like she might have stepped away for a minute. Okay, that's fine. We'll come back to her. So I'll move down to Kathy then. Kathy from, um, it's Casita Nueva, yes? Am I saying it right? Can I ask a question? Uh, please hold the question to the end. We're gonna we're still introducing our our um, panelists. Thank you. Go ahead, Kathy. Hi, I'm Kathy Yanez. Um, I am a family home childcare childcare provider. Uh, my little family childcare um, name is uh, Nuestra Casita Nursery. Um, I've been a um, Child, uh, early childhood educator for about 22 years now. I started when I was 20 and I'm, well, I just turned 43 yesterday. So there's that. Um, and um, I've worked in many um, settings. Um, the last setting was with um, Hillendale Family Learning Center and Discovery Center here in Santa Monica. I worked with them for about 10 years. I got a lot of wonderful um, training there. Um, I have been to school, but I don't have, <laughs> I feel at a disadvantage here, but I don't have a BA, I don't have a master's. I wish I did. I really, really wish I could have been a part of um, the college and university education experience. I wish I would have had that experience, but as a single mother and I'm, uh, and just, um, I, I, I just couldn't manage. Um, and, uh, I admire all of the single moms that can manage being a single mom and school and a full-time job. I, I could only manage being a parent and a full-time job, but I basically have um, self-taught um, a lot. I've done a lot of research. Um, I've gone to back, taken a couple of classes at SMC. Um, uh, if you, um, if there's something like um, uh, you know, children with um, sensory disorders, I saw a lot of that in the preschool, and so. I just wanted to know what is this, what's going on here? How can I, um, you know, gain more skills to help um, the children with sensory or, or other uh, physical disorders or, or, or delays. So I, I did a, I do a lot of that. Um, um, so I decided to open my own, um, in-home childcare about a year ago. I've only I've only been a, uh, a year in this. Um, it's been quite a huge challenge and a, a big difference from what I used to do um, in, at the preschool at Hillendale. I used to be a lead teacher there. Um, I had you know a staff of 10 to 11 teachers that would help me and and we would get everything organized and get ready for with get things ready for the children and, you know, do all the um, teamwork. 
Um, and but now I'm doing it all on my own, <laughs> and it's it's really it's really overwhelming, but also very um, satisfying um, as well. Um, I um, so I went in, in to do it here just because I felt like I was ready. I was ready to move on. Um, although I don't have a bachelor's or a master's, I, I still, I, you know, learned a lot from good teachers and bad teachers. And I made um, um, a really good community here in Santa Monica. And uh, as soon as I opened doors, I was able to um, pretty much get enough children to um, sustain the, the business. Um, COVID has been a, um, a tough experience, um, but just keeping, just updating every, every, every time they, uh, the CDC was updating for the city of Los Angeles and just uh, showing my the parents and the families here that um, I'm on top of it and I am committed to keeping the children healthy and together we're we're, um, we're keeping each other healthy in this small community. Um, it's been a, we haven't had a case. I've been open the entire time, and and we've been really really um, really well, really good. Um, the process to open your own um, family home, childcare home, it was it was not that uh, scary. Or I mean, it's scary because you're like <gasps> licensing. Oh my goodness, ah, do I have everything? Um, but it was quite um, simple, it, um, and um, and it's it's. It's it's a good um, it's I don't know I feel like I'm in a better place than I was when I was working at the preschool, but um, but I do miss the the um, learning from um, more experienced teachers, and I do miss um, the the team that I had at the preschool. Um, because it, it does, there is a lot to do when you own your own business. Um, I don't know if anybody has any questions. <laughs> we'll, we'll be taking the questions at the end. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, can I just say that Kathy is being very modest. Her school is beautiful. It is a lovely bilingual program near SMC. And when I went, I've, I've sent students there. And I, you all who know me know that I am picky about where I send my students and I would send them there in a second. Her place is absolutely beautiful and so warm and welcoming. And I can't, I just can't say enough about it. And I, I can't wait for some Q and A on you and talk. I know we have a lot of students that want to start a family childcare and you can, you can give Great. them all the, all the, all the story there. <laughs> awesome. Exactly. Thank you so much, Kathy. Thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> I'd like to move on to Pilar Gonzalez now, who's going to tell us about her program. Pilar? Yeah, thanks for inviting me, Kathy. I'm very excited to, to be talking to everyone. So I, uh, I'm the founder and director of Aventuras Forest School, where um, a forest kindergarten uh, based in mostly in Griffith Park. So we're 100% outdoors, we used to do more like indoor field trips before COVID, but now um, we do some outdoor field trips, but um, otherwise we're completely outside. And we're also a Spanish immersion program. So that's, well, as you might know, like outdoor education has been ga gaining some traction, it's still somewhat new in the US, like having a uh, forest school or, or something along those lines, nature preschools. Um, but also combining it with a language immersion is pretty rare too. So we're um, the first ones in Southern California to do it. A, a few more have popped up recently, um, but there's probably just a handful in the whole country right now. So that's been really cool to be part of something innovative like that. And the way that I got into it, um, so 
I got into education the same reason a lot of you, especially early childhood, you know, making it a positive difference in the world and getting the kids like when they're young and you can really have a big influence. Um, then I, but I'm also kind of a generalist, like jack of all trades. I had a lot of other interests. So I had, um, I immigrated from Argentina when I was six and a half. So I had an interest in language learning and that whole process. So I got a master's in teaching English as a second language. I studied linguistics and that language development. That all was really interesting. I encourage you to learn up on that if you're if you want to learn more. Um, I also had an interest in science. Like I said, my mom was a science teacher and we're always doing science experiments at home when I was a kid. So I, I studied some biology as an undergrad, but I never really got to use it. Um, so then, uh, so after I my, my master's in teaching ESL, I taught um, in New York City public schools for five years. I did this like teaching fellows program. It's kind of like Teach for America where you can get right in with an emergency credential. And I taught for five years. And um, as, as some of you may be familiar with or have experienced, like I found just like the primary public education system to just be really restrictive. Um, the schools where I taught, it was like they even, like you could get in trouble for teaching arts and crafts to six year olds. Like it was pretty ridiculous. Like. They just expected all the kids to be like sitting quietly at their seats doing seat work. So um, like I liked working with the kids. I didn't really love working with that kind of bureaucracy over me. So um, I went back and I got another master's in sociology and education. Uh, so I was interested in doing more like research and policy. So I did that. I worked for a nonprofit education development center. Um, that does research and development in that field. So, so if you have questions about the field of research, you could also ask me about that. Um, I did, I loved it at first. After a while, it got a little too abstract for me. Um, I did, like I ended up, cause in the beginning when you're a junior researcher, you're like out in the field a lot doing observations. Then later on, you're doing more just like reading and writing at your desk and analysis. So. And plus I'd been doing it for almost eight years. So I was getting just a little bit bored of that. Um, and then we happened to be moving from New York to LA and I have a son who was, Adrian, who was two and a half at the time. So when we were looking for preschool for him, um, we wanted something that come, we just love the outdoors and nature and we spoke to him in Spanish. So we were looking for a very specific kind of program that just didn't exist. So. My husband and I just had the same idea independently of each, of each other, like, oh, well, what would you think about just starting your own program? And then I said, actually, that's, I was already thinking about that. Um, so when we started to do some research, it seemed like for schools, like, first of all, I really love the innovation, the innovative aspect of it and just like being in nature myself, because um, it is really good for my mental health too. And it's just, because I had that biology background, I never got to use it. I was really excited about really learning about the California ecosystem. Like it's so unique, um, the Mediterranean climate and the biodiversity. It's really interesting. So, um, so I like that aspect of it and, and the innovative aspect of combining it with language learning. And then on a practical level, like, you know, I could have tried to do a home daycare, but I didn't really have the setup for it. So um, in that sense, it was a little bit easier, um, but it's still a lot of work because, um, you know, you have to just learn about a lot about safety and logistics and like, uh, you know, like every parent will ask you like, what happens if it rains or like, what happens if, you know, some crazy person is in the park and seems threatening. Um, so you really have to do your homework about that kind of stuff. Uh, it's not like an easy job, but it's really exciting. You know, every day is different. Like a, and I think one of the other presenters mentioned that um, the, the, the days can be kind of unexpected in, in teaching. And, and I, I thrive on that. Um, I know some people like to have more of like predictability and, and schedules that are the same every day, but I like that um, it, it's exciting to me um, to have that serendipity and those like teachable moments that come up if you like you find uh, some interesting insects or um, other wildlife. 
Um, so yeah, those are the basics. And um, I wanna echo what, what some people said about finding your communities. Um, in addition to men mentorship, which is great, I also found a lot of like networks of other educators that are more like peers on my level. So Natural Start Alliance is amazing for, they're like a huge, like, like one of the main organizations for like early childhood outdoor and nature-based education. So I, if you're interested in that, like I totally recommend that you sign up for them. Like they have an email list where you can just, you know, we ask each other questions. They have a website, newsletter. They have a great conference every year. Um, that's just like every topic you would want to know about in early childhood education. They do advocacy and they're part of the Na National Association of environment, I'm missing an, a letter in there. It's N A A E E, I think, something about environmental education. <laughs> um, so uh, there's also, you know, some Facebook groups and also Wonder School. Um, that's how I met, met that originally. I joined through. I, I started my school through Wonder School. They also they they support mostly home um, daycares, but they also uh, help people open um, for schools in, in a few cases. So what I liked about that is that there's both like there's mentorship and there's a Slack group, um, which is kind of like an enclosed social network where you can ask uh, your own peers questions too. Um, and, and they have a platform so that you can do, you can schedule tours there and do payments and things through Wonder School. Um, so that's something you might want to look into. They are pretty active in um, Southern California and Northern California. And yeah, also uh, like conferences, workshops, and also just reading books. Like um, I read a lot, both about like um, nat natural history and like the actual nature in Los Angeles and in California. And also more just like theory, a little bit more theory, theoretical, like this one is about balance and barefoot is about um, how nature is really good for like physical development. It's good if you're interested in the intersection of like physical therapy, occupational therapy and, and nature. Um, this is like, this one is more about like a form of outdoor education, coyote's guide to connecting with nature. And then like anything by David Sobel, basically, he's one of the godfathers of um, nature-based education at, at the stage level too. Um, yeah, so, and, and just like sign up for newsletters and things like that, um, always be educating yourself. Um, if you wanna run your own program, I really recommend that you, it, it helps to be like an organized person. Like I have an app called To, to Do It. P O D O I S T, and I just have like I have task lists, and they're sorted with like due dates and color coded and everything, um, and tags um, because there's just so much to keep track of, like the development of the individual children and parent relations and you know marketing tours. Um, there's just so many different um, areas of work to keep track of that you really need to stay organized. And it helps out, obviously, as some of you said, communication skills, communicating with parents, communicating with um, other teachers. Oh, and by the way, I will, I'm sending my email address right now and I will um, type up some of the, the books and authors that I recommended. I, I got a request from someone. So I'll definitely write that up too in the chat. Um, and then I also recommend that you really pay attention to your own mental health, especially if you're running your own program. Like there's this saying of like, put on your own oxygen mask first before you can uh, help others because you're a role model. So the kids will be really um, emulating you, imitating you. Um, and it can be overwhelming, you know, to be running your own program. And like I said, you're just firing on all these different cylinders. It's easy to let the work like slide into your evening and into your family life. Sometimes it seems like there's just an infinite amount of work. Um, so to set those, limits and the work-life balance and your own mental health. Um, like I, we do mindfulness and meditation and yoga in the school. Um, so I find that that helps me too. Um, 
but yeah basically like I like I love being able to be my own boss like part of the reason because when I quit teaching I thought that I would never teach again to be honest uh, when I quit teaching um, in elementary school because I was just like oh there's too you know there's too many restrictions on me I know that this is not how kids learn um there's all these incompetent administrators making bad decisions you know um and so but the reason I was able to go back to it was because oh it was I was being my own boss and I felt that in early childhood you do get more flexibility uh, I'm sure it depends somewhat on the program and um things like that but you know once you get to like elementary school it's like the testing and the and the state like everything is very like top down at least at the public school like a regular public school um so i really love just being like hey you know oh ruth bader ginsburg died i want to do a unit on feminism cool like that's my decision i i know it's good for the kids you know, as long as, you know, I plan it and, and I get the parental buy-in and everything, like I can do almost anything that I want. Um, like there's a lot of considerations, but I have that freedom to really like give the kids what I think is best. Um, so that's really cool. And then for COVID also, like we did end up, um, I mean, it's hard to say, but we did end up benefiting from COVID in a way because um, you know, we already knew the value of outdoor education, but now a lot of other people are seeing the value of outdoor education because you get the space to spread out, the sunlight, they think like UV kills um, viruses and COVID, um, the air is like circulating, um, there's fewer like surfaces and toys and things to touch. So we've been receiving a lot of inquiries. So, so that's cool. Um, uh, yeah, so let me look at some of the, um, so a typical work day, let's see, I'm not sure how much time I have left. Do I have some more time? We're just, we're just gonna, yeah, you go ahead and, and, and take another minute and then we just have two more speakers to introduce and then we'll move on to the Q&A. Okay, so I did wanna mention a typical day because I know it can be a little bit hard to visualize like what a four school day is like, so. Um, so our school day is nine to one. Most four schools are half day programs. So we get there a little bit before that and I bring my supplies. Uh, my car is just like full of supplies and we have like a wagon. So we bring in um, supplies and, and the water and, and we just cart everything around. It's like a portable classroom. And I have one other teacher now. We have a four to one ratio. Um, and then, you know, we do some of the typical preschool things snack, circle time, we go for walks. So the nature walks are nice. We eat outside, which is really, um, I, that's one of my favorite parts is like reading outside, doing art outside, like everything is more fun outside. Um, so then, so then we go through, you know, somewhat typical preschool day, but you know, it's, it is very child centered and there's a lot of free play and, and we are, you know, we do follow the kids interests. And then at one, um, I pack up and uh, while my, the other teacher watches my son and then, uh, then I transition to, I have a workspace that I go to and then I do administrative work from like two to five. Um, and I try to end work by five or 5.30 for to have family time and keep my sanity. Um, but yeah, that's, a, and, and you know, I do virtual tours in the afternoons right now because of COVID, but that's like a typical work day. Um, yeah, and then I'll save the rest for a question to you, Nathan. Thank you, Pilar. Um, before I get to our next panelist, I just wanted to announce that those of you who are here and for extra credit to be sure to hang out because we'll have a sign in sheet in the chat here in a little bit. So you can make sure you get your credit. But Pilar, that was just a really wonderful transition to our next panelist, who is um, my favorite person in the world. You'll find out why. Um, so I'm going to let her introduce herself and tell you a little bit about her journey, Amanda. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. Hi, um, I'm Amanda. Um, Professor Kathy Miller is my mom, is, is why she said I'm her favorite person in the world. It was no diss to all of you wonderful people. Um, <laughs> so I am a preschool teacher at a, um, uh, child Development Center in Ventura, the Great Pacific Child Development Center, which is 
Patagonia, the clothing company's on-site childcare center. Um, I've been teaching for seven years almost now. I, I was teaching since my very, um, well, first semester basically in college. I took an internship when I was in high school with uh, Malena and Kathy <laughs> um, in their program with two-year-olds, I think it was, uh, and kind of started to fall in love with the field, but wasn't like, I still like wanted to be an artist. I think I wanted to like paint all the time. So I didn't end up like fully committing to being a teacher up until a couple years ago. And um, the big kind of transition for me was going to Denmark and visiting a forest preschool there and seeing what I realized I wanted preschool to be and what I wanted to teach and how childhood should look and feel in like the children. And it just kind of changed my whole perspective. So uh, I think I'm probably, probably one of the earliest in my, in the field, um, or sorry, I should say like I've been in the field the least amount of time compared to all these wonderful ladies who've been speaking. So I'm in kind of similar place with a lot of the students here, I think is that I, started off at a community college, got my degree there, uh, transferred to CSU Channel Islands, and now I'm working in the field as of last fall when I got my bachelor's degree. Um, let's see, what else can I talk about? So the program that I work at is a big outdoor classroom program proponent. We are outside at least 80% of the time normally, and during COVID that is way up. We rest outside. We, when possible, we change diapers outside. Um, it's it's really wonderful. Um, let's see. I have questions I can answer. Do, do, do. Um, I already kind of talked about like how an internship helped me is that I took an internship and was like, oh my God, this field is actually really awesome and it's really wonderful. Uh, I love it. I, I wake up every day and I'm excited to go to my job, which I think is probably the number one perk is I can't think of a lot of jobs that you can jump into pretty quickly out of school that are labors of love like that. Uh, I don't know. What else should I talk about, Professor Kathy? Well, daughter Amanda, you could um, <laughs> talk about going to school to be an occupational therapist and what you would like to do there. Sure. So one of the things that really catches my attention with my students is when I see children who are on the autism spectrum or who are struggling with ADD. And so that's something that I really wanna work with one-on-one -on -one with my students. So I am planning on starting my occupational therapy training, which is a master's degree. Um, and that is it's kind of similar, you know, with a group of people, you get a um, license it's, and then you uh, either join a practice or you start your own practice. And that is kind of um, maybe not the most like, like typical um, career path, but it made a lot of logical sense to me is because I discovered that I love working with children and then I'm kind of narrowing in on how I would like to work with children. Isn't she adorable? <laughs> I made her myself. So. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Amanda. Um, our, very la our very last guest, and then we'll, we'll move on to the Q&A, is someone I've known for very many years. Oh my goodness, I can't even think of how long I've known Affie. Um, but I'm going to let her talk a little bit about her career, which is something that you may not have considered, and that is a yoga instructor for young children. So Affie Coberry. need to unmute yourself so you can talk. Yes. Hello. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi, Kathy. Hi, everybody. For those I know. All right. So, yes, my name is Afi Kavari, and I am uh, teaching children uh, yoga for the last 20 years. And prior to that, I was preschool teacher. And um, for 10 years, I graduated from Mopar College and then transferred to CSUN for finishing. And then I got interested to teaching yoga to the children by, you know, when I started practicing on myself because I had so much problem and I had 
to do yoga and discovered that it's really helping me. And um, I switched to uh, stopping from there to getting all my credential or certification uh, for yoga. And because one of my children in the classroom was really, really low uh, autism child and she was two and a half and I was fascinated that was my first experience seeing a child with autism and I thought that I want to reach her I want to help her and that's why I thought that oh yoga can be something special and so I went to India and I got all certificate here I become yoga therapist from Loyola Marymount University all the things that the adult needs to have um, to be able to teach and give certification, all those things you need for teaching yoga. But the India was really eye-opening because I watched them how they teach children with special needs. So my first intention of getting to this field was yoga for special need children. And I practiced it many years in my home and going to different schools. And I thought it was really working but then uh, in last uh, 20 years of working in different schools and becoming, uh, I think, Kathy, I don't know, that was 11 years ago when you were teaching at Moor Park College. I think that was 11 years ago, more maybe. I started teaching in Child Development Center and um, I have uh, my own yoga room and my own program to teach different classrooms. So it become my base, my home. Uh, Moore Park College, Child Development Center, it's my home. And then I was going to different school and still working with uh, some special needs centers that they voluntary works in there or uh, private. So that's introduction. But then why yoga works is because yoga is working with your whole body, your whole uh, here, what you are, your five senses. So I realized that and I helped myself with that. And I had the background of my education, child development, how to teach children yoga and uh, children in the classroom at the circle time, how do you reach them? How do you grab 15 children sitting around you and you can read them a book? That's not an easy job. So they taught us how to do this, a grabber, and then you invite them with the song, with whatever you are uh, probably know what to do. And then you have a teaching moment and then you have the ending and closing your um, time at the story time and cognitive or uh, music, whatever you are teaching children. So I had that background and then I created a program based on that and I called the Yoga Mama. So my program is always the same to invite the children with this special thing that it's called magic box, or it can be anything. Uh, when I have workshops, I say that it's not that you have to stick with my magic box. You can just have your own way of grabbing children, but it has to be always the same. So children can uh, call it that, oh, she's calling us, this is a time for yoga. And then you use all different kinds of animals uh, which in my booklet that I made is um, um, lion pose. The, the actually in adult yoga, if you're familiar these days, everybody more knowing about yoga. When I started, I had to be very, very careful for using uh, words to not get accused for teaching their children religion <laughs> the part. So it was very, very tricky 20 something years ago. And then now you can, but then using the animals like a dog pose, a cat pose, which we say the same thing, the lion pose. I mean, I can go on and talk about it, but if you have question, I can go more in detail to tell you what and how you do that. But then when you teach children this poses, the movement, you give them freedom to be who they like to be 
and how they like to present their dog. It's, it's their own discovery, their body, body in the space in feeling comfortable that, oh, I can do this. I can be a tree, I can be a windy tree and my leaves are uh, flying or I can be cat and making sound meow and go around the room. But then when you do this old movement with the children, it's very hard to bring them back to your attention again. So what I made is I do not use words because it's something that I always hear. Don't do that, sit down. So sounds is very powerful. So chanting is very powerful. So I always use different sounds, a bell or this is the sound. So it's very soothing, but then when you hear this it means quiet. So I don't, I introduce these sounds to them at the first class and then repeat it again. So then eventually they all know that when you hear this sound means shh. When they hear the, the bell, means to sit crisscross. So the children really respond to sounds so much better to you. And you can use these tools in your own classroom when you're teaching children in a regular classroom setting, not necessarily yoga. So when I put in a workshop, the teachers of preschool, they can use all these tools that I do in yoga. They can use it in their own classroom for grabbing their attention for something else, or they can grab one pose and say that this children sit down and breathe. And then they do a special, practice of the breathing and calming them down and then they do that. So when this all goes and movement and warm up and the poses and then at the end, then they do the chanting, which I call this chanting is the repetition of the words. And then what is it is a coordination of your movement, sounds and watching the other. So basically, what yoga is using all your five senses and all the things that you want to cover in the teaching children under one umbrella and that's yoga and all these are your senses. So then they say chant, which I don't use Sanskrit word. I use just the words of love, friends, hug, and we repeat it and repeat it and repeat it and this touch me themselves, repetition of the words and the sounds that they can hear themselves. It's so powerful. And in last, I guess, 10 years, no, six, seven years, I don't know if uh, Kathy was there, that I become, I, I made it, added the yoga eating to my program. And oh my God, voila, I thought that, why didn't I do this at the years ago, only doing it in a special time like Thanksgiving or so special timing that I would bring something to put in their mouth because of regulation, allergies and all those that. But I got permission from all the parents. And then this was, this become the favorite part of yoga. I can't tell you that. Half an hour yoga, the children come to just wait and experience of putting one gummy in their mouth they're saying that, what is yoga? And they say, yoga means be patient. Then what do you use in yoga eating? Five senses. We do all the math included in this. What are your five senses? Your mouth for eating, your nose for breathing, your eyes for seeing, your ears for listening, and your little pinky for touching. So they're putting that in their mouth they cover their ears and listen to it. Whoever is taking the longest one or is the one that can taste and feel one little gummy. This experiment has been working in a lot of workshops for adults that when they teach you to really become aware of what you put in your mouth and we don't pay attention adult, how much, how many times, when do you really pay attention every spoon you put in your mouth? or dinner or lunch. So teaching children, it brings their attention 
them to their parents to bring that how important is our body to put something in our body, how precious is that we can chew it, taste it, feel it. So these are the things that I'm teaching. Well, become aware of yourself to become loving to other children, other human beings, no competition, no judgment and self-awareness and self-love to love other human. And then the rest it comes, it's a, it's a long thing, but that's what I'm doing and that's it. I wanna be short because I can just go, 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 go and tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Afi. I have to say, Afi came to my class of two-year-olds and said she was going to do yoga with my two-year-olds. And I'm like, ah, okay. <laughs> yeah, good luck with that. Um, she had, Milena will back me up on this and so will Amanda. She had my two-year-olds in Shavasana with covers over their eyes, meditating. I had to take pictures of it because I'm like, no one is going to believe this. And of course, when I would try and do it myself, I just... I didn't have the yoga mama magic. I, I don't have the <laughs> wonderful accent. I don't have the, I just couldn't, I would be like, come and sit children. And they were like, ah! So it was, it was just really, it's yoga instructors are wonderful people. We can all learn to do yoga for sure. But yoga mama is magic and yoga instructors are magic. Thank you, Thank you Kathy. Thank you for being always my support. I love always your support. support. <laughs> I love you. Are you kidding me? I love you. I love you. So much love I in this room. Okay. I miss you so much in there, but you know what? It is so hard to teach children in Zoom now. I'm telling you, this is the hardest thing I have done in my whole life. Teaching children yoga in the Zoom is just like a, I climbed the mountain Everest. I, I mean, after the first couple of times, I collapsed and I thought that, oh my God, this was half an hour, but they don't, they, it's so hard to teach three, four years old in the Zoom. It is the hardest thing. It's hard to teach 25 year olds on Zoom too. <laughs> it's all hard. It's hard for all of us and we're doing it. Um, yeah, I would I'm love, thank you. It. Thank you. I would it. love to thank open you. this up now to some Q&A. Um, we have a couple panelists that have to leave pretty soon. So if you have a question um, for Ramona, who is our early interventionist or Tamar, who is our temple, Isaiah director, guru, wonderful person. Um, you're going to want to either post those in the chat first, or you're going to want to raise your hand and we'll call on you um, before they have to run out of here. So go ahead and uh, post it in the chat, raise your hand, whatever, and we'll just start calling. All right, I'm going to start with Catalina, unmute yourself. Good evening, everyone. I have a question for Tamar. Could we text her? Yeah, I put my phone number in the chat. I'll do it again. Um, let's see, eight six two wait nine eight zero. Okay, I've put my cell phone number in the in the text in the chat box again. And feel free to text me anytime. Okay, I will do so tomorrow. Thank you okay. so much. You're welcome. It was great meeting you. You too. Awesome. Um, I see a hand up with uh, is it Taisa? Go ahead and unmute yourself, my friend, so we can hear you. Yeah. I had a question for um, anyone in the panel could um, answer this. Um, as early childhood educators, how do you combine early childhood education into later on in life? My motivation for wanting to go into early childhood education is I have children. I have I think we just lost her. Taysa, we lost you there for a minute, but I think I got the gist of what you were asking. Does anyone want to try and respond? Tamar? If I got the gist of it, it's she doesn't want to work with young children, but she wants to study early childhood. She has Oh no, I want to work, I want to work work with young children but as my children go, get older if I could work for a school that's like TK all the way to 12th grade I kind of want to stalk my children while they're in school that's my motivation oh I got it okay so then what you want to do is you want to go to the California Commission on Teacher Credentialing or Google the um, California Child Development Permit Matrix and you want to get yourself a, um, a teaching permit 
and try to find a job in one of the public schools that have early childhood centers as well. So that way you can work in the early childhood program and they can keep matriculating from grade level to grade level. You'll probably wanna get at least a master teacher permit. Um, and if you want, again, my number's in the text box. Oh, and Netta, put it, Netta just put it up. Thank you, Netta. Um, but you're gonna wanna see what the requirements are for a master teacher permit. And that's probably the first, the best place to start. I will also tell you that as your children get older, um, there are some universities like USC, if you work in their childcare center, um, you actually would get free tuition for your children if you work in the childcare center. Um, and some of the childcare centers that are on university campuses pay the same, you're on the same teaching salary as you are uh, if you're a professor. So for example, when I was teaching at Cal State LA, they had the Anna Bing childcare center there. Their preschool teachers were making about 56 to $70 an hour um, salary though, because they were on the same teaching scale. This is true. I hope that helps. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in the chat, Jennifer said for Ramona, I'd like to know about the program from LAUSD. Is there any qualifications that you need? And how do I go about getting into the program? I am a special ed assistant right now and would like to know how to get my foot in the door. Okay, so I applied through www.lausd.net. Um, but I also put my phone number and email in the chat. If you want to email me, I can get you the information. But that's where I just started. I started off on their website. And since I was already a special ed assistant, um, it was a little easier because I was already in the system. But that would be the first way to go, go to their webpage. And someone also asked about occupational therapy positions. Um, I'm sure there is. LAUSD is a big district and there's always opening for occupational therapists, occupational therapy assistants, speech language pathologists, speech language pathology assistants. There's always opening in the district. I wanna, I'm gonna add though too, don't just think that you can only work for LAUSD. There are a lot of little school districts all around. There's Beverly Hills, Culver City, um, you know, the beach cities all have them. You have Compton, you have so Glendale, Pasadena. So, you know, yes, set the bar to where you wanna be eventually, but um, to get your foot in the door doesn't mean it just has to be in one door. As long as you have a proven track record working for any unified school district, you'll be able to get into somewhere else as well. Yes, and there's also Downey Unified that's close to. Awesome. Um, there's a question for Kathy here. Um, after you opened your family child care, how long did it take you to get your first child in and with how many kids did you start your business? Um, so I actually was quite um, lucky. There was a program, uh, there was a provider that was closing her um, um, family home childcare. And so she connected with me, uh, she connected her families that um, still needed childcare. And uh, there were about four families and uh, she connected them with me and uh, they were, they were interested in, in what I was, you know, what I can provide. And so they transferred over. When she closed, then they came to me. So I was pretty, pretty lucky. Um, that doesn't really happen very often, but I think, you know, just um, reaching out to the communities, to other providers, there's always uh, uh, lots of uh, family childcare providers have a waiting list, which is a waiting list of infants or toddlers. Um, I have a waiting list now. I've only been over a year and I, I have a waiting list on both, both uh, for infants and uh, preschool age. So, um, you know, you reach out to other family childcare providers and let them know you're, you, um, that you're opening your own and if they could, um, if they can um, send some families that they, that, you know, that they might not be able to accommodate at, at this time, um, that could be a way to get children in um, as soon as possible. I but it does, it does take some time. It can take up to three months, depending on the area that you're in. Again, when I looked at uh, where I wanted to open my child, family childcare home, I, you know, wanted to say in the community that I have created a lot of um, um, uh, reputation in, 
which is here in Santa Monica, because I've worked in the in preschools um, here in Santa Monica for over for ten years, and um, and you know just kept in touch with the families that uh, um, that I used to be their preschool teachers with, and so they were also they were also very um, quick at sending me um, uh, references or or families or that they knew that needed somebody. I I want to jump in and add because I did um, mentor and coach a lot of directors of family child care provi- uh, programs and um, everything that was shared right now is true. Uh, there are, but there are also a lot of ways to plan ahead when you open your your family child care. Neta, um, you cut out there. Oh, sorry. You lost you. Can you hear me now? Okay, so there are a lot of tips and tricks to getting that first enrollment in a family child care program. You're on mute. Okay, can you hear me now? Okay. Um, I started saying that there are a lot of tips and Maybe tricks. Maybe if you turn off your camera, Netta, sometimes that helps. Sorry, okay. not that I don't want to see you. Can you hear me better now? Oh. No? Oh, I hear you. I can't hear you. It's so frustrating. She was saying something so important. <laughs> I think Maybe it's only Kathy. Well, Netta, if, if you can, can hear, hear us, we'll come back to you in a minute, or you can <laughs> put what you were saying in the chat, and um, I can read it if you want. Um, I can hear her. We all hear it. <laughs> we can hear um, her. Okay, so I'm not sure who the student is, but they're, um, <laughs> they can just hear her name says iPhone NSA 3, they've had their hand up for a while, so uh, iPhone NSA 3, you're on. What question, what's your question? Um, I'm, can you hear me? Okay. Wait, hello? Maybe having some more, more troubles here, it sounds like. The students can hear me for some reason. You can, can you hear me? Can you yeah. hear me? Can everyone else hear we Netta? We can hear you. Yes. Can you oh, hear well, me? I'll just shut up. Go ahead, Netta. Can you hear me? Up. Oh, sorry. Um, so uh, let, me just, let me just try to say what I just started saying earlier about the family child care programs. There are a lot of tips and tricks about it. And um, if I can give you my short list, it would be number one, before you open any kind of child care program, study the area that you're going to open it in. Does it make sense? Are the families there able to meet your expectations of income? It's really important. If they can't, are there R&Rs, resource and referral agencies there that you might be able to work with to get children that will receive subsidies? Those are the children that need you the most, so don't knock it. It's really important. Number two, come in with a very clear philosophy and vision for your program. What will set you apart from other programs is the quality of education that you provide. The higher the quality that you provide, the more chances are that you will get to that point where you have a wait list of people wanting to come in. Not to mention the fact that that is what we want for every single child. Find mentors to work with you on that. That is really, really important. Number three, other than just reaching out to local um, childcare programs that might um, refer families to you, you want to advertise everywhere. So whether it's posting uh, in community centers and um, local parks and posting on Facebook and using utilizing social media to get those people in the door, those are very, very helpful methods get the word around currently. Hosting open houses. Even if it's now during COVID, you can have an open house via Zoom. You can lead tours via Zoom. So these are great ways to get your name out there. And my final tip is to take into account that when you just start out, you need to prove yourself. Because nobody knows who you are. Nobody cares how much you got on your classes at SMC. Um, Parents want to see reviews and references from people that you actually worked with. And when you just open your program, getting that first enrollment is the hardest thing to do. So you might want to consider lowering your tuition rate in the beginning, 
getting as many references as you can from people that you worked with in the industry before opening your own childcare program. So you'll get that first enrollment. We used to say in, in the company that once you get your first enrollment, the second one will follow immediately after. And then the ball starts rolling. Remember that if you were planning to make $1,000 tuition per child, but no one is willing to pay that, you'd better off offering $800 per month per child and making that than making nothing. You can always raise your prices later on if needed. So it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. You're married to your job and it's in your home. But if you choose to go for it, the shortage of childcare in the USA in in general, but in California in particular, is mind-blowing. There are literally millions of children who do not have any secured spot in any high-quality, licensed, supervised child program in this state. You are needed. Can I, um, I she's completely, Correct. So before um, I worked on my website, I opened up a Yelp. I, um, I um, let's see, I advertised just like she said through parks, going to parks, uh, previous families. Um, and uh, so it was only, it wasn't only the referral, referrals that I got from the provider that was closing her doors, but it was also uh, a lot of footwork that I did. So, um, you know, flyers, um, flyers at coffee shops, going to the breast, the, what it was called, the um, breastfeeding pump place. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know the word of the place, but you know, new mommies, seeing them at the park and hey, you know, I'm, I'm, my name is this, this is what I'm doing. This is how long I've been a childcare, uh, in the early childcare, um, as a as a teacher, da, da 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 da. I'll have an open house on this day. Through COVID, right now, um, the um, the open houses I'm doing is um, when the children all leave. So Monday through Friday, after my after after all children leave. So that's 5:30 on, or even on the weekends. I was doing a lot of um, a lot of uh, tours on the weekends at the beginning. Um, and she's correct, you are married. I open my bedroom door and I'm at work. So <laughs> it's very, it's very hard, but it's also, you know, um, it's also a great opportunity to be your own boss, um, to uh, set, um, set the curriculums as, as you feel they are great for the children. Um, I don't know. I, I also have an outdoor um, um, qualified as an outdoor classroom teacher. So we spend our time outdoors um, all day, mostly. And yeah, it's, it's great. But um, if you have any more questions, I will put my email on here for you guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have some more questions in the chat. Um, someone asked, is there a specific SMT counselor I can see to plan out my ECE degree? You want to switch from dental hygiene? Hey, hey, we got another one. All right, yes. We have two absolutely amazing ECE counselors, Flor Sandoval and um, Angelica. Angelica just got married. I don't remember her, her new married name. But you can go ahead and make appointments through, through Coursera Connect, or you could call our main office. I put the directions in the chat. So please, please, please talk to our ECE counselors. The regular counselors at SMC are amazing. They're great for all of your general ed, but you wanna to talk to the ECE counselors to get an ed plan because otherwise you might get some wrong information um, about your ECE classes. And I've heard horror stories about people taking classes they didn't need or not able to transfer because they didn't take something that they needed to take. And our counselors are angels from above. They know it all. They know it all, so definitely. Um, someone asked, trying to look here. 
what's the best way to get my foot in the door as an assistant teacher without any in-program experience hours? Is Tamar still with us? Now I think tomorrow, I think tomorrow logged off. Too bad. That's a great question for her. But anyone else want to take that? What's a good way to get experience if you don't have any any experience? A good way to get experience is first of all to take any kind of classes that offer practical experience. EC21, EC22, those are the basics. Woohoo. That will get you practical experience. Once you have those, it's much, much easier to try and find a job in a family child care program. Those usually don't require their assistants to have the experience and the units that are required in centers. So you can work in those. You can work at independent programs. Forest, forest schools or nature programs, just like Pilar's, are a great way to get your experience in. And while you're doing that, continue your education so you do get to those minimum units that are needed to work in centers. Volunteering, another way to get experience while you're, while you're doing that. All of those things that can go on your resume and they go a long way once you start applying for the quote unquote big centers or big programs like Head Start uh, and you try to get your foot at the door. I'm sure Melina uh, has more to add on that. Oh no, you're muted. Melina, did you want to add on to that? <laughs> I think I think if you want your uh, your your microphone to work, take out your your headphone set because sometimes the headphones that they're not working properly. If the internet is low, so you have headphones, take out your. This is from Melina. Take your headphones, take off your headphones, or disconnect it from, or take out the Bluetooth. So you can hear better, or in, you can hear me. my coworkers say that the headphones work better. Is this better? <laughs> yes. Oh, okay. Um, so I was laughing at it because I was um, just chatting with Kathy in the chat box about um, like the volunteering, the, the internships. Um, I know that, that uh, CSUN requires a one-year internship for their bachelors, um, but there are practicum classes at community um, college level that offer hours, but you can always reach out um, to an agency, for example, Head Start for volunteer opportunities. I can, I can say that a lot of us in the field probably say we started by volunteering. I started by volunteering. I was actually a nursing major and I got through all the prereqs class and did my first nursing rotations and realized I didn't like sick people. So that was kind of a, that's, that's a downside to being a nurse if you don't like sick people. So my daughter's preschool teacher at the time said, hey, why don't you come volunteer? And I did and I fell in love with it. And that was Moore Park College Child Development Center. And I, I stayed for 15 years. They couldn't get rid of me after that. So yeah, absolutely. I, COVID has thrown a wrench into everything, but in general, you could call anywhere and just say, hey, I really need to, I'd like to volunteer. And people love to have the hands on. Call Tamar, Tamar's yes. always someone good to call. She's a director of a huge center and she knows other places, you know, so always, and get, get the most diverse experience you can. Like Nutta was saying, work at a forest program, work at a Montessori program, a radio program, a Head Start program, an early intervention program, doesn't matter. If it's not what you wanna do forever. You're still getting all of that you know, experience. And I thought I'd never want to work with toddlers when Melaine and I were told we had to do a toddler class, fell in love with toddlers. And now I make a career out of toddlers because mm -hmm. they're the best people in the world. So you never know. You never know till you try. Okay. Uh, wow. Lots more questions here. I, I see mean, a lot of questions that I love it. I see a lot of questions about the um, the, the permits and uh, yeah. teaching certificates. And they're different questions, but they all go down the same line. So to have your own childcare, family childcare, you don't need any kind of permits. You just need to get uh, approved by community care licensing. You can go on their website. They have a full explanation there on how you can get licensed for a small, uh, for a small, um, small family childcare program to begin with and later on how you can um, extend to a large 
um, to a large program. And uh, they also offer, actually must go through an orientation. I'm happy to support anyone who wants to go through that process. This is what I do for a living. I'm happy to support you through that process and really go down into details to explain it. When you go to work at centers, that is where it starts to get tricky. Centers such as Head Start, any kind of program that is funded by the state um, and a lot of other centers do require teachers to have a permit. However, there are also many private preschools who do not. So it really depends on the school, on the, on the setting of the school, the director, the requirements of that specific school. And I would suggest reaching out whenever you're applying for a job and really reading and checking, do you need a permit? Do you need to have it in advance for getting the job? or if that is something that you can acquire within a certain amount of time after getting the job. Knowing that getting a permit on regular times takes roughly three months. During COVID. <laughs> um, and I wanna add to that, cause I know it was a, a question in the chat um, with Manaz, is that how you pronounce your name? Um, you do not need uh, the associate permit to apply for a position with our Head Start agency, but you do have to be qualified for it to apply and to interview. So that is something that you don't have to have in your hands when you apply, but as long as you meet the qualifications. Um, so I have my teacher permit and um, I, I need just one class for getting my AA degree. And just I want to know after my getting a AA degree, can I work as a teacher at the Head Start program? I don't have bachelor. Uh, we do require a bachelor's for a teacher. It's oh. associates. Yeah, associates for a TA, a teacher assistant, but a bachelor's for a teacher. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. There's a really good question in the chat about being qualified for a master teacher permit and seeing that there are a lot of openings that you can see on Craigslist and other ads that don't require, you know, a permit or experience. And um, I, I know what I'm going to say about this, but I'd love to hear what our panel has to say about working for a program that will hire you without um, those qualifications. Check. We're very well where you're putting your feet into. That is what I will say. It's all about quality. It really is all about quality. And again, as I said earlier, there are, there are great private schools out there who don't require you to have that permit, but they will at least expect you to be qualified for one, or they would have reasonable minimum qualifications to hire you. Um, if they have no such requirements and they will literally hire anyone, I don't know if I would wanna work there. <laughs> Yeah, and I just, you know, to, to not to avoid the question, um, just like I said earlier, really surround yourself with the people that that you admire that that you that are living what you want to be. Um, so if you and I know that like taking a job is, is sometimes not a luxury, um, but just keep that in mind that that you need to surround yourself and build that community of where you wanna be. Um, if that's where you wanna be and those are your goals, then you know that would be your decision. But if it's not, if you'd like to get your bachelor's and maybe surrounding yourself with people who have their bachelor's would be you know, really like a support group because um, as I know with Kathy and Kathy knows with, with myself is even our closest other friends that aren't in the field, they struggle with being supportive sometimes. Um, you know, they don't necessarily understand the journey that, that we're on. So really find that that group of people for yourself that's gonna that's gonna encourage you and to, you know, re-energize you when you when you get tired and frustrated and you know there are setbacks, which there will be. Um, so, you know, if, if, if given the option, 
because I know a lot of people don't have the option. It's like, this job will take me and I need a job, then that's a whole, you know, personal decision. But just keep in mind that, that it really is a big part of your journey is to surround yourself with the, with the people that, that are going to support you in what you want. Very well said. Thank you. Um, Afi, a couple people are asking if Yoga Mama has a website, if you could talk a little bit about the benefits of yoga a little bit more, or do you have contact information you can provide us? So, yes, okay. yes. It's uh, easy actually, it's a yogamama.net. That's my website. And um, my contact, you can, my phone is on my website too, but if you like to write my phone number is 818-735-0745. And then uh, I forgot when I was talking to tell you that, and what I do, it's my, my career, my job, but the reason that I really like to um, have workshop or talk to the teachers is our job is always not providing is not a good uh, salary for us as a teacher preschool teachers so teaching yoga it always gives you extra and a good extra income in the afternoon because I used to go myself to all different schools preschools and um, teach at, at the extracurriculum. And then I give a, a certificate. So you can become, you don't need to become a yoga teacher, certified yoga adult teacher. You can have certification as a yoga um, uh, teacher for children with your background of uh, uh, teaching. Um, or the degree in a child development. And when you go to different schools, preschools, you can always say that, okay, here is this is a program, I can uh, offer it and then go and teach yoga to different school. And it was really and a good income for me uh, back then um, to different preschools. And there are so many after program and even elementary school. I taught so many years in elementary school, the same thing that I teach children, young children, it can be opened up and extended to their uh, age appropriate. And then uh, you put it in that. It's up to you, your creativity and how you play is the same as when you teach young children in preschool. It's the same how you provided the circle that the children stay with you for 10, 15 minutes or they just run away. So the yoga is the same. So is that clear if you wanna explain more, if you can, if you like, you can email me contact, but this Corona has really changed everything so far because it's really how are gonna be, how are we gonna teach children yoga in the classroom? We're not in the classroom and in the Zoom, it's very hard, it's hard for me. So I don't know what to say. For now maybe soon we can go back into real class i hope we're not going to stay in zoom that doesn't make sense but if you have any question <laughs> thank you afi afi are you still doing teacher trainings yes yes i'm actually having uh, two workshops as coming at moor park college for a student of moor park college that then i'm having two hour workshops for them and training how to teach young children yoga in the Zoom, in the what Zoom. But they're they are adult students, they're more Park College students, they're not children. <laughs> so we're gonna have it um, in November uh, 19. So we'll see how it goes, but it's gonna be two hours, that's a minimum. So we're gonna uh, discover and talk about it and I show them the tools and then we're gonna practice get into the group so they can actually hands on and doing it. I don't know how, but Cindy Magic, you know, you know, Cindy, she's gonna lead the workshop for me to students can uh, become in a group and then practice it. But it's really fun, fun thing to have an uh, extra job as you don't, if you don't want to have it as a 
main job for yourself, but it's really have a side job to have yoga teaching children. I th Nancy's about ready to have like a, a, a fit over here. She's dancing and doing interpretive waving around. I think she has a question for you. <laughs> okay. You go to one of these things and then you, and you're like, oh, why am I here? And then somebody starts talking and the magic, the bells went off, Afi, the bells went off. So okay. this thing that you're presenting on November 19th in Moore Park, is it open to, to students that are not? No, I think it's only for the students of these practicum classes that the Moore Park College has. Okay, so they not offer the privately, maybe you'll yes, do the other yes. ones. Maybe like if there is some interest. Yeah, if so maybe, Affie, I don't know, Kathy wants You to. happen to know a very attractive professor at Santa Monica College. Yes, here she is. Perhaps, I she know. Would, perhaps you would do a workshop for us. Well, we'll see that. I'll be happy to do that. All right, there you go. There okay. you go. We'll put that together. Okay, I'm looking for some other questions. So you want to try and wrap it up soon because we want to respect our um, our panelists' time and not keep them here all night. Although God, we sure would love to. And um, I posted um, the form. I'll post it again for you to receive credit for being here tonight. So it's both attendance and if you're looking for extra credit, um, be sure to put Professor Miller or whoever your professor is in there and then we'll have the whole sheet, we'll divvy it up when ECE, I'm sorry, when co cruise is over and we'll email all of the professors. There you go. So make sure you, you look in the, in the chat and find that form so you can get your, get your extra credit. Oh, there it is, thank you. Netta was saying that many schools offer professional development opportunities, send you to conferences, workshops. Someone had asked if there are any schools that help pay for education. Um, I know that Tamar used to at Temple Isaiah. She used to pay money for the students to go take their ECE classes, but during COVID she's not. But I do know that, yeah. So there are, there are some that will, that's always something to ask. That's always something to ask. That's there a good question. I, I wanted to touch base really quick that my agents Oh, sorry. My agency does offer tuition reimbursement. There you Let's go. Start. There you go. Yeah, it's a, it's a great. There are mm -hmm. stipend programs from yeah. different um, LA up or I think they're, they're called Child 360 offer all kinds of stipends. Schools that are participating in QRIS um, um, programs usually have stipends for continued education for their teachers. Mm -hmm. There are many, many opportunities to professionally develop that are not necessarily going into a degree program. You, you can professionally develop in so many ways that you don't have to pay an arm and a leg for. And if you just keep your ears open, ask questions, seek those people who know what's going on in the industry, you will find those opportunities to grow. It's out there, it's at your reach. It doesn't have to be a $30,000 degree. No, it doesn't. Um, so we do offer um, tuition reimbursement. Um, and then I'd also like to share that as a home-based educator, um, I've gotten the chance to attend conferences in um, chi Chicago, uh, Philadelphia, um, DC, um, a week, you know, seven day trainings in, in Berkeley, um, there are agencies out there that will support your professional development. And I personally, you know, consider that a, a selling point. So um, I guess the best advice that somebody has given me is don't, don't see who will hire you, that you want to see who you want to work for. That, that's such a great advice. And I wish Amanda was still on, Amanda, who's oh. my daughter, um, where she works. You know, the pay is pretty competitive, but the benefits are incredible. She works for Patagonia and they are a social justice organization as well. And they actually have a legal fund if you get arrested for protesting. <laughs> so things like that, which is hilarious. They have um, reimbursement like for clothing there. They get a huge discount for clothing. So, I mean, there's just, there's sometimes there's perks that you might not know about. I used to work for a center that paid for us to go to conference every year. So there are things like that for sure. So always look into it. I also just put the link, Professor Charlene, I put the link in here earlier, but I put the link in here for the Child Development Training Consortium. So you can do, if you are working in a center and taking classes, you might qualify for a reimbursement. So definitely check that out. I put that link in there. Okay, I'm gonna see if there's any other questions before we... Kathy, I have yes. a question, I'm sorry. Go for it, don't be sorry. Just ask. Is that uh, Jennifer? Hi, Jennifer. Hello. <laughs> 
<laughs> I, um, Kathy was actually my teacher. <laughs> but um, so my question is, um, before COVID, I actually was, I actually went for an interview for Bright Horizons at UCLA and I got the job. But with the whole COVID thing, you know, everything got put on hold. Um, but when I went to the interview, they told me that um, um, they have this program where they would pay for my school if I were to stay with them. Now, I'm almost done. I'm on my last semester from SMC. So now I'm kind of like, mm, what should I do? Um, because my goal is to get my AA um, for early childhood education and also my AA for art and I'm combining both of them because I'm looking into going into for art therapy for children. Um, now, my plan was um, starting to work at uh, Bright Horizons with them and actually um, continuing my studies with them with the program that they have. And um, since everything's on hold right now, I don't wanna lose, I don't wanna like, um, I wanna make more of my time right now. So I don't wanna lose that time. So my question is, is there any universities that someone would recommend that I could go into studying um, for art therapy? LMU, but you need your bachelor's first. Okay. <laughs> Jennifer, email me privately. I'm gonna put you in contact with my daughter. She has an art degree and she's doing it informally and she has looked into it. Okay. Thank okay, you. everyone, I just wanna encourage you again to sign the attendance sheet. And I think we just have time for maybe one more question before we let everybody go. So if anyone just wants to un unmute themselves and ask a final question, go for it. Kathy, can I share what I was speaking with you earlier? Share it in the chat, share it in the chat. Yeah, okay. yeah, thanks. Any other questions? Yes, Professor Miller, where's the, um, at the attendance sheet? I don't see it. You look in the chat, Vicki Rothman sent it to everyone. There's a there's a link right there. And she just put it in there again. So you just click on that link. I have a question. I've heard a lot of you say that you um, went on to get your master's degree. Was that in early good child um, education or was it in another um, area as well? That way you could still kind of hoover around a bit because um, I was looking into elementary education, but I didn't know if that would just limit me to only the classroom. Uh, we could all just say what we got it in. My master's was in educational psychology with emphasis in early childhood education from CSUN, and my PhD will be in um, something different, <laughs> interdisciplinary studies with a focus on early childhood. I got a master's in teaching English as a second language that was K to 12 and a master's in sociology and education. Um, and then I took a few um, child development courses at um, UCLA Extension to supplement that. I, um, I uh, have a bachelor's in early childhood education. And um, later, I just took any additional class that could have gotten me to my goal. So administration classes, adult supervision and mentoring. I took classes on um, special working with children with special needs. I really tried to, to, to get my hands into all kind of every, every piece of information that I could, even if it didn't get me to another degree. Um, I'm currently thinking about my master's and trying to decide my own, uh, my own path. And I have to say that in general, I see two paths. And this is what I speak with a lot of my uh, mentees. You can go after your bachelor's and become an expert in one particular niche. So you can start with a child development 
degree or uh, early childhood education and then narrow it down until you have that one niche that you become an expert on. That is one way to go for it. The other way, which is what I personally go for, but to each their own, is to start with whatever it is you started with, but then starting to expand. So for me, I know that when I take my master's, I don't want to do it in a very, very niche area of being an expert on one thing, but I want to expand and open as many doors as I can. So I'm thinking about, you know, uh, doing a, a leadership, educational leadership or something that will really open my horizons and open doors where I could continue to advance. Um, but I think ultimately it really depends on what is it that you want to be when you grow up. When I grow up, even though I am not as young as I used to be, I want to have as much experience as possible, but that's me. But if you want to become an expert in something, then you need to draw that path and narrow it down into that. It's very true. All right. Well, thank you so much to our panel and for all the wonderful questions tonight. I'm, I don't know, did we break the record, Vicki? Did we get the most people here? I think we were, we were over 80 at one point. Yes, at one point you got to 90. Early childhood for the win. <laughs> all right. Thank you again for everybody.